Well, Christians have always been a persecuted people. From the time of the apostles and the early disciples to today, we are a persecuted people. And we're persecuted because Christ is in us. And we desire to live like Christ. And we desire to follow Christ. And we desire to make Christ known. He said himself in Mark 13, 13, that uh, we would be hated by all for his name's sake. In John 15, 18, he said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And John said in 1 John 3, 13, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. And Peter is writing uh, his first epistle to Christians who are being persecuted. They are facing rejection and animosity and hostility and hatred. So Peter writes to comfort them and to remind them that this is part of the Christian experience. They shouldn't be surprised or lose heart or question God, but they should stay the course. And so what he does uh, in the first two verses is remind them of how the triune God is working for them. From their election to being brought to, to life by the Spirit to obedience because of the sprinkling of Christ's blood. And, and then he prays for God's grace and peace to be multiplied to them. Well, after this, in verses 3 to 5, Peter almost can't help himself, and he breaks out into a doxology. And a doxology just means a praise of God. It's praising God for who he is and for what he has done. And Peter reminds the saints of how, how God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all involved in their redemption. And, and he does so in praise to God. Uh, and this praise deals with the details of how God has brought these suffering saints from death to life. Uh, and what, what, what that gives them now, and what that gives them in the life to come. And I'd like to look at, at really only verse 3 today, and I'd like to do so using a three-point outline. And then, Lord willing, next week, we'll look at verses 4 and 5. So for today, the three points of verse 3 will be, Peter praises God, Peter praises God for the new birth, and Peter praises God for what the new birth brings. So let's look at the first point, Peter praises God. And he starts off by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and, and the Greek word for blessed uh, is only used eight times in the New Testament, and it is only used for God. It's only used of God. And what Paul, Paul says almost the identical thing in Ephesians 1.3 and also in 2 Corinthians 1.3. In Romans 9.5, Paul says that God is blessed over all. In, in Mark 6, uh, 14, 61, Jesus is asked if he is the son of the blessed, to name a few. So it's always used for God. Uh, and, 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 and the Greek word, from this Greek word, we get the word eulogy. We get the word eulogy. And eulogy is, of course, a speech or writing that praises someone. Oftentimes we hear that uh, when we go to wakes. Well, Peter will now praise God. And, and in the Old Testament, it was, it was always, blessed be the God of Abraham, or blessed be the God of Israel. But now, now in the New Covenant, it's blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Abraham and Israel were identified with God, but now God is identified with his son. Because he is one with his son, and his son has revealed him to us. Because he has been with the Father for all eternity, as Jesus is the second person of the divine trinity. But he is also the Son of Man, which means he is 100% man. So he is God in the flesh. And now as God, Jesus uh, was, the, he, was the eternal Son of God, uh, so God was, was his Father. But as a man, uh, God was Jesus' God, just as he is your God and my God. As a man, God was his God too. Uh, and, and, and he came to show us the Father and to reconcile us to him so that we could know him as the Father. He told Mary Magdalene uh, right after his resurrection in John 20, verse 17, he said, go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. So now his Father is our Father, right? And, and now his Father is our Father uh, and he is our God and he is our Father. And every time Jesus talked of God, he called him his father, except for one, except for one. When he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And the Jews would have never called God their father. They, they hated the fact that Jesus did that. Because to them, it meant he was making himself to be God. In John 10, 29, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And in verse 30, the Jews pick up stones to stone him. Because they say in verse 33, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself to be God. So then Jesus had an intimate relationship with the Father. And all who are in Christ are related to him and have God as their father as well. So we are now family. We're family. Ephesians 1.5 says that he has predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus. And Galatians 4.5 says he redeemed us that we might receive the adoption as sons. So Peter wants to invigorate the souls of these suffering saints. And so he points them He points them to the one who has mightily and extravagantly blessed them. He doesn't open the letter by by talking about their problem, right? He doesn't do that, but rather their blessings. Like you and I might open the letter and say, oh, I'm so sorry you're being persecuted so badly and you're suffering so much and you're losing your income and your houses are being burned and and, and et cetera. He doesn't open up with the the problem, right? He doesn't. He doesn't do that. He tells them the Lord's blessings. He's showing them that God comes first. And when God comes first in your life, you instinctively praise Him. When you start with God, your problems are placed in their proper perspective. So He's calling them to seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6.33 He's calling them to set their mind on things above, not on things of the earth, Colossians 3, 2. He's calling them not to love this world or the things in this world, 1 John 2, 15. So here it is. He's saying, stop focusing on your suffering and start focusing on your salvation. This is the message. Stop focusing to us. Stop focusing on your problems and start focusing on your salvation. Stop focusing on your woes, on your troubles, on the coronavirus, on politics, on your job situation, and start focusing on your salvation. Listen, those problems, they're problems, and they're probably not going to go away anytime soon. Stop focusing, he's saying, on your illnesses and your family struggles and, and, and the troubles you have with your supposed friends. Stop focusing on the here and now. Stop focusing on the ills of social justice. And I hate it. I'm not going to do us any good, though, like, but killing ourselves with it. Focus on your salvation. That's what he's telling these saints. Focus on your salvation. And bless God, who is the source of all your blessings, which flow from Jesus Christ. And bless God in the midst of your persecution or troubles. Bless Him in the midst of your trials. And when the world is crumbling all around you, and when your body is in pain, and when you're up to your neck in trouble, and when the church is cracking and crumbling in front of your eyeballs. Bless God. Bless God, brothers and sisters, because He is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And He is our Lord, and He is our Savior, and He is our Redeemer, and our our Messiah, and He is our brother. And He was sent to save us, to save us from our sins, and, and to take and to take us from death to life, and to qualify us for everlasting glory. So then there should never be an inappropriate time for us to bless God and to speak well of Him. People ought to know, people ought to know how highly we think of Him, and not just on Sunday mornings. So Peter praises God. Secondly, Peter praises God for the new birth. And there he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. Who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. Who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. Well, Peter praises God who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. And begotten again means to be born again. To be born anew. To be regenerated. And the Bible uses this particular Greek word only twice. The second time is 20 verses later uh, in 1 Peter 1.23. Uh, uh, where, where he says we've been born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible. 
Now, before we consider what it means to be born again, and we will, notice that Peter says it is according to God's abundant mercy. So we were born again according to God's abundant mercy because God was merciful to us. Uh, and the reason he has to give mercy is because we desperately need it. Yet we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. Listen, the man convicted of a crime pleads for mercy from the judge on his sentencing because he knows he doesn't deserve it. He's pleading for mercy. And the truth is, what we deserve is justice, which in this case would be eternal punishment uh, for our sins. Right? That, that's justice. We deserve justice. And I remember when Pastor Phil and a bunch of us were, and, and Nick and a bunch of us were uh, at, at, at the protest uh, we weren't protesting with them. We were preaching the gospel um, at, at the Barclay Center. I saw tons of these signs, and I've said this before. It says, no justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Oh, Jacob was with us too. No justice, no peace. And I thought to myself, well, that's the Bible. Like, that's the Bible. God demands justice. He demands justice. Justice for sins against him. For lawless crimes committed against him. And every time we sin, we're, we're committing crimes against God, really. Right? And he demands justice, the payment. And there can never be peace with God, and certainly not the peace of God, unless there's first justice. And justice happened at the cross. Brothers and sisters, there is justice. Not Black Lives Matter and Antifa and everything else wanting justice. No, we need justice. God wants justice, and he demands it. And we, that's what we want is, is, is for him to be merciful to us because justice was paid at the cross. So we deserve justice, and that is we deserve punishment for our eternal sins. And no one earns the new birth. No one is entitled to the new birth. It's given solely by God's mercy. You see, he wills to have mercy on you, and he wills to regenerate you. We read in, in Romans 9.15, he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. And, and mercy means that God doesn't judge us according to his justice, but according to his grace. Because he's already judged Jesus for us. The Lord, charges, the Lord charges us. Justice finds us guilty and the righteousness of God calls for our death. But we praise God who is rich in mercy and has raised us up to new life in his son. So God is under no obligation to have mercy on anybody, but he chooses to have mercy on some. Uh, and what we need uh, and what we want more than anything is his mercy because apart from it, we can't know God uh, and, and, and we certainly can't know the Lord Jesus. Uh, nor can we ever experience any of his blessings. We just can't. So we desperately need mercy, and the scriptures tell us much about his mercy. Peter says his mercy is abundant. It is abundant. It is so much more than enough to pardon every one of God's elect of all their sins. His mercy can, is so much greater than our sins. He has more mercy to give than we have sins to commit. And because it's God's mercy, that means it's infinite and it's boundless. And it's, it's his action towards us while we were still in a helpless condition. Psalm 136, 2 says, His mercy endures forever. Luke 178 says, His mercy is tender. In Titus 3, 5, it says, It's according to his mercy that he saves us. Ephesians 2, 4 says that he is rich in mercy. And it's because of his great love that he shows us mercy. Listen, mercy is... The, what, what, what's undergirding his mercy is his love. Because he loves us, he showers us with his mercy. Therefore, ought not his mercy to motivate, motivate us to love him? Ought not his mercy shown to us motivate us to love him more and more? Think of all your sins that his mercy has covered. Think of all your sins that his mercy has covered. And truly, what sin is so great that it cannot be covered by his mercy? I have met people who have said to me that they have sinned so greatly, that their past is so horrendous that God could never forgive them. They've said it to me point blank. And you know what I say to them? I said if God can't forgive them of their sins, whatever, however bad it is, then they'd be the first. Then they'd be the first one that God just couldn't forgive because their, their sins were so bad. 
Because God will forgive the sins of anyone, no matter how horrendous, if they repent of them and they believe in Jesus. And we have an excellent example of this in the, in the scriptures, right? Christian killer, number one enemy of Christians, Saul of Tarsus, the chief of sinners, who we know as the Apostle Paul. God forgave him. Listen, because we've received such great mercy, it should break our hearts when we sin against him, when we remember the goodness of his mercy upon us. So a new birth was prompted by God's mercy. And this should remind us of just how desperate our condition was before, before Christ to need such mercy, right? That's why we need mercy. And sadly, sometimes we don't praise God as we ought to because we have forgotten just how bad our situation was before he saved us. We forget. We forget that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We forget that, that we were without Christ and hopeless and without God in this world. We forget that we were in darkness, and Ephesians 5.8 says we were darkness. Not that we were in it, but we were it. We forget that, as David said in Psalm 51.5, that we were brought forth in iniquity, and in sin we were conceived. So if you rightly understand how bad your situation was, and, and that God alone brought you out of it, you praise Him for His mercy. Jesus said in Luke 7.47, He who is forgiven much, loves much. He who is forgiven much, loves much. And we've all been forgiven much. But we forget sometimes just how much that was. But if you don't see what He has saved you out of as a big deal, there's not going to be a lot of praise going on. Not going to be a lot of praise going on. Let me give you an example. If someone saved you, from stepping into a puddle. And, and you were thankful, and you would be thankful for that moment, right? Oh, I didn't step in a puddle. I didn't get my shoes wet. I didn't soak my socks. Might have been cold. You would be thankful, right? You would be thankful in that moment. But if someone saved you from dying of kidney failure by giving you a kidney, you will have a greater thankfulness and you will be thankful to that person for the rest of your life, would you not? You would be thankful for the rest of your life because you got a kidney that made you live. You might be thankful for 20 minutes for the person that saved you from the puddle, but you're going to be thankful for the rest of your life from the person that saved you by giving you a kidney. Christ saved us from an eternal damnation. Christ saved us from the lake of fire forever. Shouldn't that make us thankful over and over and over again. You see, we're prone to forget just how, how sinful we are at times because we focus on other people and we think we're not that bad compared to them. We see their sins as bad and, and lose sight of just how ugly our sins are before God. So we desperately need God's mercy. Spurgeon said this. He said, no other attribute could have helped us had mercy been refused. As we are by nature, justice condemns us. Holiness frowns upon us. Power crushes us. Truth confers the threatening of the law and wrath fulfills it. It is from the mercy of God that all our hope begins. Well, it's according to God's abundant mercy that he has begotten us again or makes us born again. And to be born again is a radical, supernatural transformation of the heart that takes one from spiritual death to spiritual life like that. It means to be given a new nature, a nature bent on righteousness, not sin, bent on holiness, not wickedness. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, if they're born again, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So to be born again is to be given a new heart, one that loves God and desires Him and wants to please Him. And we read it today in Ezekiel 36, where God says, I will, He's going to do it, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And, I will keep, and, and you will keep my judgments and do them. So God changes us. And He changes us from the inside out. He puts, he puts new and holy affections in us. And when He does, we become sons of God. We are birthed into His family. And He becomes our Father. Romans 8.14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these, these are sons of God. In 1 John 3.1 it says, John says, Behold, check this out, it's amazing, he says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. How is that, John? That we should be called the sons of God, or children of God. That we should be family with the divine. In Galatians 3.26 Paul says, for you all, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So we're born again, and we've been born into God's family. And here are two realities, two realities of this new birth. One is that it is an absolute necessity, and the second is that this new birth is by God and God alone. So first, it's a, new, it's a necessity. It's an absolute necessity. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3.3, 3, Most assuredly, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I'll often say to people I meet on the street, and I did it the other day, actually. And I, I point them to John 3, and I said, listen. I say, oh, you're born again. I don't even know what that means. I said, well, Jesus said it's the most important thing in the world. He said, this is the difference between hell and heaven and hell. And I show him John 3, and I say, look what Jesus said. Unless one is born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You cannot see the kingdom of God. I said, so whatever born again means, you desperately want that. Because if you don't have that, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven, which means you're going to, see, which means you're going to stay where you are in, in, in the kingdom of Satan, and you're going to see eternal death. So you need it. And at least, I think it starts bringing a conversation, putting a provocation with what does it mean at least? If you're not in the kingdom of God, that means you're still in the kingdom of Satan. Uh, and that means you're under the wrath of God. Well, Nicodemus doesn't understand the new birth, so he says to Jesus, how can this be? How can this be? Can a man be born twice from his mother's womb? He takes him literally, of course. And Jesus answers that in verse 5. He says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And water symbolizes the Word of God, which, which 1 Peter 1.23 is going to allude to. And the Spirit, of course, is the Holy Spirit. So you hear the Word of God, and the Spirit of God takes the Word, and it, and it drives it into you, and it brings you to life through it. So you must be born again. You might need a million other things in this life. But you don't need anything more than to be born again if you're not born again. That's what we need desperately. Secondly, it is God alone who rebirths people into his kingdom, who regenerates you. We have absolutely no part in our spiritual birth, just like we had no part in our physical birth. John 1, verses 12 and 13, as we read today. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believed in his name. Now he's going to explain. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, so one is not born again because their parents are born again, or because they desire to be, or because someone else wants them to be, but because God desired it and God did it. Colossians 2.13 says, and you, these are now people who believe, right? Being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your sins. God did it. 1 John 2.29 says, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. There's an evidence that you're born again. You practice righteousness. You live a life that looks like holiness. 1 John 3, 9 says, Whoever is born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. He's not saying you're sinless. He's saying now the new nature, right? Now the walk is to walk holy. You no longer walk in sin. Now you desire to walk holy. 1 John 4, 7 says, Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
1 John 5, 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And in James 1, 18, he says, Of his own will, God's own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. And brought us forth means to give birth to. He's birthed us. Now there's a common mistake today, and many make it, which says, once you believe, well then you're born again. You gotta believe first, and then you'll be born again. And we talked about this in my last sermon. Right? You believe, and then God regenerates you, then he rebirths you. Absolutely contrary to all the scripture we're just talking about here. It's contrary to it. It's contrary to the scriptures. You see, first a dead soul and a dead heart and a rock hard heart must be made alive and then they can be given the gifts of repentance and faith. Right? That's what has to happen first. So before you can believe, you must be made alive. Before you can believe, you must be made alive. Right? First, first, a dead soul and a dead heart must be made alive, and then they can be given those gifts. Listen, we today can all go to a funeral home, if they're still having funerals nowadays, and, and, and it can be caskets all over the place with dead people in them, and I'm telling you, we can preach to our hearts are, are, are just on the floor. We can preach to them and preach and preach and preach. We can call in the greatest preachers of our day, and I'm telling you, not one of them is going to respond. They're going to stay in those caskets. Why? They're dead. Dead people cannot respond. Spiritually dead people cannot respond. Just like physical dead people cannot respond. You must be made alive first, and then you can respond. There must be life before there can be belief. Belief doesn't create life. Life creates belief. Belief does not create life. Life creates belief. A baby must be born before he can cry and eat and need a diaper changed. But we must be spiritually alive before we can repent and believe and be saved and be justified. So regeneration of being born again comes first. Jesus said in John 6, 65, no one can come to me, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And he grants it by giving them new life. Right? Then they hear the word. They hear the word and they repent and they believe because their hearts are now open to it. So, so being born again comes first. You must go from being a child of the devil to a child of God, from a child of wrath uh, to a child of God. You see, we are naturally destined to eternal death, but God raises us up to eternal life. So instead of wrath, we receive mercy. Instead of death, we receive life. So, that, so, so then in our, our first birth, we were born with a birth defect called sin. But in our second birth, we are born clean and pure, and that's called grace. In your first birth, you were born in Adam. And you came through the flesh, which means you were born in sin. But in your second birth, you were born, you were born of the Spirit. So then the reason we must be born again is because, because as 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus said in, in John 3, 6, in the conversation with Nicodemus, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So if you're going to be brought to spiritual life and live a spiritual life, it must come from the Spirit. Before you were born again, you were simply flesh. You were a natural man. You were not a spiritual one. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says so. It says the natural man, this is the unsaved man, the man that doesn't have the Spirit of God in them, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? For they are foolishness to him. Nor can he. Nor can he, because they are spiritually discerned. You need the Spirit of God to discern, to understand, to truly believe and live spiritual things. You can't do it without the Spirit of God. You can intellectually understand things. You can be a, a, a Bible scholar and whiz. You can have a thousand verses put to memory and be dead as a doornail spiritually. Romans 8, 7 and 8 says, the carnal mind, that's the unsaved person, the carnal mind is enmity or at war against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Here you go, you can't. Nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So man's greatest need 
man's greatest need and what me must preach is you must be born again. You must be born again. George Whitfield wrote a letter to Benjamin Franklin saying this. He said, As you have made considerable progress in the mysteries of electricity, I would also honestly recommend to your diligent, unprejudiced pursuit the mysteries of the new birth. I love that. I love that. And, 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 and it's this mystery that would be the great comfort to these suffering pilgrims that Peter is writing to, and to us as well. And so we see Peter praises God. Secondly, Peter praises God for the new birth. And finally, Peter praises God for what the new birth brings. And again in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope. To a living hope. So what the new birth brings is a living hope. And a living hope means a hope that is alive and not dead. It's not a wish, not a crossing of the fingers, right? A living hope is an absolute. It's a certainty. Now when the world speaks of hope, it's a wish, it's a gamble, it's a dream, it's, it's something you would like to see happen, but you have no clue that it ever will. So they hope their kid gets into an Ivy League school or the college of choice. They hope they win the lottery. They hope it doesn't rain next Saturday and Sunday. Right? Hope for all kinds of things. But they have no, no idea what's going to happen. But, but the Christian's hope is a surety. It, it, it's, 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 it's assured. Because, because as the rest of verse 3 says, it rests or is anchored in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what that gives us, verse 4 says, is an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled, 100% secured. So the moment you were born again, you were given a living hope or a lively hope. A hope that, that Colossians 1.27 says is the hope of glory. A hope that Romans 8.24 says that we are saved by. A hope that Romans 5.5 5 says will not disappoint us. You're not going to be disappointed. A hope that Colossians 1.5 says is laid up for you in heaven. A hope that Galatians 5.5 says is a hope of righteousness. Right? This is a hope, Paul said in, in Acts 23.6, in the resurrection of the dead. In Colossians 1.23, this is the, the hope of the gospel. You have the hope of the gospel. And in 1 Timothy 1.4, it, it, he says that, that Jesus is our hope. And, and Titus 2.13, that his return is our blessed hope. And because of that, Proverbs 14.32 says, the righteous have hope in their death. I thought about that. The righteous have hope in their death. That means no peer, fear and panic in our death. How many people on their deathbed, they, 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 they have no clue what's coming. They got their fingers crossed that they prayed enough prayers and said enough good things about people and gave enough money, but they have no hope. Listen to what Matthew Henry said about we have a dying hope. He said this, He whose head is in heaven need not fear to put his feet in the grave. He whose head is in heaven need not fear to put his feet in the grave. Listen, that's the last lap for us, right? When we're on our deathbed, should we get one of those? But we have a hope. We have a hope at that point that we're going to go from this, this disintegrating body to glory. David said in Psalm 16.9 that his flesh would rest in hope. And in Hebrews 6, 18 and 19, we're told to hold fast, hold fast to the hope that is set before us. So putting it all together, our hope is something future, something to come. In a sense, we hope for spiritual blessings and the advancement of the kingdom now in this life, and we do. But our great hope is in the life to come and all that that entails. So our hope is alive because we believe in the living God. And the living God lives in us and we live in Him. And so, so, so we were once a people who had no hope. But, but now we've been born into hope. And that is a hope that is full of life. Oh, we, we may have thought we had hope uh, before we were saved, but we, would, we had a dead hope. 
We had a false hope. I mean, think of the things that you hoped for before God saved you. Just what did you hope for? Don't answer me now, of course. But think about the things you hoped for before you were saved. Uh, think about those things. Like the stock market and making more money and a better house and money in the bank and pleasure, pleasure, pleasure galore, easy life, long life, good health, and so on. We hope for all those kinds of things. But they were temporal. They were passing away. And even if we got some of those things, even if we did, they don't satisfy very long and they don't last long. And maybe, maybe you hope that your good deeds would get you to heaven. That, that your, your good would outweigh your bad. How many times have I heard this? Oh yeah, you know what? When I'm done, the Lord will see that I did this much good and that much bad and let you in. The problem is, there can't be any on this side. It's got to be all right there, and you don't got that. But we think that. I thought that. Right? We think that our good will outweigh our, uh, outweigh our bad. We think that, that uh, our church membership or baptism or giving or serving uh, or that our parents are Christians would be what it takes to get us a spot in heaven or, 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 or that we've done good things or maybe praying to Mary and the saints or receiving the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church or praying five times a day towards Mecca or go washing in the Ganges River. Somehow, those things would give you eternal life. But all of those things and a million more, absolutely useless. They're absolutely useless. And to hope in them just leads a person to ruin, eternal ruin. Listen, the world offers you false hopes. But God delivers you from hopelessness and gives you and I a living hope. And our hope is rock solid because it's based on the life and the death and the resurrection and the ascension and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is anchored on his work on the cross, on our behalf. So it's not a fleeting hope. You know, when I was 12 years old, I hoped one day to be a major league baseball player. Who, who knew it wouldn't happen? That was my hope. And then when I was 17, you know what I hoped for? Trans Am. I wanted a Trans Am. They were the coolest cars on the road, and I wanted one because I thought they would get girls. That didn't go good either. Now, when I was in my 20s, I hoped that I would be rich and famous. And that didn't happen either. And, oh, and, and, and all of those hopes are just fleeting. All of those hopes would please me, to exalt me, to benefit me. But when God saved me, gave me a living hope, one that would indeed come to pass and last forever, and one that wasn't rooted in this life, but in the next. So, so you and I, you and I can have nothing we desire in this life. This life can be extremely hard uh, for us. And, and still, we have the guarantee of the life to come. We have a hope that is, that is far surpassing anything anyone can have in this life. It's far surpassing it. You know, Proverbs 11.7 says that the unbeliever's hope will perish, but ours is alive forever because we, we will live with Christ forevermore in the new earth where Revelation 21.4 says there'll be no more tears, no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There'll be no more pain or, or suffering. The former things have passed away. So as Peter will say in 1 Peter 1.13, uh, we're to set our hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that means when he comes again. Our hope is a future hope. When people hope for things, they hope for things that they don't have now, right? Ours is for a future hope. And when he comes again, it's going to be fulfilled. And the grace that will be brought to you, that he will resurrect your body to meet your soul in heaven. Uh, and, and, and you will one day be a glorified, resurrected person, body and soul. Listen, we have a hope that, that, we, have a hope that we, can, we can have great confidence in because we know how it all ends. It's like buying a book and reading the last 10 pages first. Right? You know how the story ends. Well, we know how the story ends because we have the word of God. We have God's word on it and God cannot lie. So we, we stand firm on the promises of God and the work of Christ. Right? That's what our hope rests in. Therefore, our living hope will sustain us as we endure hardship and suffering. And it's going to help us to stand fast in the midst of trouble. Right? Knowing that our ultimate reward is not found in this fallen world. 
So this hope enables us to put things in their proper perspective and to sort out what really matters, what's of eternal importance and what's passing away. So then, when we're discouraged, this hope lifts up our spirits. And when we're tempted to throw in the towel, this hope keeps us going. And when we're anxious, this hope dulls the panic. And, and when we struggle with sickness and pain, this hope helps us to trust in God. And, and when we fear, when we fear the worst, this hope reminds us that God is still in control. And, 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 and when we feel abandoned and all alone, this hope reminds us we're not alone. And when we've lost a loved one, hope in the life to come helps us through the grief. So we have a living hope, brothers and sisters, and because of that, we don't jump ship when, when, when the going gets tough or there are things that are hard to understand. We don't go back to the old ways. We stand firm. We dig in our heels. We continue to trust God because we see the big picture. And those around us, who are without a living hope, they see the difference between us and them. And it may move them to ask why. And as Christians, we should encourage each other with our living hope. You know, when a brother or a sister is really down or struggling, I try to remind them of their hope. Of their hope. The last six months of Louis Colbert's life, before he died from cancer. I got to spend a lot of time with him in hospitals and driving him to hospitals and all the kind of places to see different people. And, and, and I kept reminding him of the hope that he had in Christ. And he said to me, it is so comforting to hear these things. And it's what he wanted to talk about, what was to come. And we need to do that for each other because we live in a world that is immersed in iniquity. And, 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 and the devil and the demonic realm always have us in their crosshairs. So we need to fix our eyes on the prize and the hope that is to come, amen? amen? Well, let me close by asking two questions. Two questions, and the first is this. Does your living hope cause you to live lively for Christ? Does your living hope cause you to live lively for Christ? Does it stir you to action? Because, because truly... Would it, would it not be rather odd to have this radical, assured hope and not live like you had it? I mean, you, you have this amazing hope. Would it not be odd not to, not to live like you had it? Now, what will dampen your liveliness for Christ is if your heart is not set solely on Christ. If you have one foot in the kingdom and another foot in the world... It's not, it's not going to be, you're not going to be living this life of, of, of this hope, right? Or if the cares of this world are weighing you down or the pleasures of it, right, have you captivated, you're not going to be living for him. If that's the case, you know, you, you're going to have your hope in the wrong place. You may be hoping for things that can't bring you to, true joy. But we, we can reset our hope, if you will. We can reset our hope. Once again, to be a living hope by putting our focus on Christ and Christ alone again. Amen? Now my second question is, how do you know? How do you know that you're born again? It's a good question. I would say you know you're born again the same way you know that you were physically born. Uh, and so, so, so even though you don't remember your physical birth, you know that you're physically alive. You own a birth certificate. And that birth certificate says when you were born, where you were born, even who helped you out. It tells you all of that. And, 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 and maybe you even have that little hat that they give you once you're born. And maybe you got that little bracelet. And maybe you got a footprint or whatever it is they give to you when, you, when you're first born. And you probably have pictures of you laying on your mother's chest. And maybe in your father's arms. You have a lot of evidence that you were born. You have a lot of evidence that you were born. And, and the same is true about the second birth. You have evidence of that. Right? You know you've been born again because you desire God. You have new affections. And you want to obey them. And you have godly sorrow when you sin. Repentance is a reality in your life. And you love Him. It's a reality in your life. 
You love his word. That's a reality in your life. And you love his people. That's a reality in your life. And you have a burden for the lost. So the question is, are you born again? Are you born again? I'm not asking if you believe in the things of God. I'm not asking if you've been baptized. I'm not asking if you're a member of a church. I'm not asking if you grew up in a Christian home. I'm not asking any of those things. Good if you've done all of those things. But I'm not asking that. I'm asking, are you born again? Because if you are, then you can see the kingdom of God. And if you're not, you won't not. You will not. So it's a critical question. Not one to take lightly or just to put off. Right? And, and if you're not born again this day, if you're not truly, truly saved, if you're not regenerated, you can be. You can be through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So then trust him today for the forgiveness of your sins. Believe that when he was hanging on the cross, every one of your sins were hanging on him and he paid for all of them. And plead with him, plead with him that the abundant mercy of God would shower over your soul and that he would bring you to spiritual life. And don't wait another day to do this. Don't wait. Don't put it off because you don't know that you're going to get another day. Cry out today. Cling to the cross today. Believe in Christ for eternal life today. And if you do, you too will be given a living hope. Let's pray. Father, how critical it is that men know that they need to be born again. And Lord, how important it is that we as your people tell men they need to be born again. Thank you, Father, for changing the hearts in you that you've changed and for birthing us into your kingdom. We praise you and you alone for it. We praise you, Father, for giving us new life in Christ. We praise you for giving us a living hope. We praise you, Lord, for an inheritance that will not fade away. We praise you for giving us sonship into your family. Uh, and Lord, for those this day that know you, I pray that we would praise you for it all the more. I pray that we would see what we were saved from, have greater understanding of our own sin, uh, Lord, that you've given mercy on, uh, and Lord, praise you rightly for it. And Lord, for the souls here watching or listening uh, on, on Facebook who don't know you, have not truly been born again, uh, Lord, I pray that you would make it very evident that they do not know you, and they will not see the kingdom of heaven, and they will see eternal death and damnation. And I pray that you drive them to the cross where they could find life. And I pray you do that, Father, for your glory's sake and for their good. In Jesus' name, amen.